All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Options Hour. My name is Don Kaufman, host of the Options Hour here on CFN. And as you guys know, this is called it show. So give us a call here at TFNN to uh, ultimately ask me anything in regards to, well, options. And uh, for that regard, we can talk about options. We can talk about some of the underlines that are about to have earnings here, either yesterday or today. It's earnings season, which is always kind of an exciting time to, to discuss options and derivatives in general. But as always, uh, give me a call here at 877-927-6648. And uh, I'll also uh, tell you guys, over the last couple of weeks, I've been traveling like a madman. So I haven't been on the Options Hour all that much, but I am here today. It is your chance to uh, to give us a call. And, uh, again, uh, here it is. So, um, you know, line up the callers because there's nothing worse than being on an Options Hour of a call-in show when nobody calls in, which, uh, yeah, it's just kind of lonely talking to myself for, uh, you know, X amount of time here on the show. You know, let's uh, let's jump right into it and talk a little bit about markets. Obviously, talk about a couple of the underlyings that have got some earnings announcements and and so forth coming out, um, and some of the surprises. I mean, a uh, Crocs is that a surprise? We make plastic shoes. It it reminds me of um, you know going back. It's like L A Gear. Like when I was a kid growing up, you know, L A Gear was spectacular until the company basically blew themselves up. Um, not to say that that's going to happen with Crocs, but uh, you know that one that one didn't surprise me. The only thing I think that surprised a lot of people is the fact that Crocs is now one third or sorry uh, two thirds of its value from yesterday. Stocks down uh, about ten dollars right now. Ouch, that had to hurt. Anyway, with that, futures are up 12.50 today. That's Spoo's E-mini S&P 500 futures. Uh, NASDAQ futures up 20. <clears throat> Dow futures up 96. Uh, everything pretty much off the lows of the day. It looked like for a while we were we were sinking again uh, today. But the uh, the VIX is also confirming a little bit of this up move here. The VIX is now down buck thirty nine in the day. Um, just uh, in the last half hour, we've actually seen a little bit more of a considerable rally here. And, uh, you know, there's, there's not really a, a confirmation, though, per se, of this rally. <clears throat> if you take a look at the bonds, bonds are kind of flat up on the day. And uh, in most, you know, uh, I guess prototypical rallies that you'd see, you typically see <clears throat> the bonds trade down as things happen in kind of a, a cyclical uh, rotation, meaning that capital, for example, comes out of the bond market. And the, when I mention bonds, I'm usually looking at bond futures for my quotes. That's forward slash ZB, uh, and forward slash ZN is the 10-year notes. The ZB is the 30-year bond. The ZN is the uh, the 10-year note out there. You typically see in kind of that, again, prototypical rally of money coming out of the bonds <clears throat> into the S&P 500 futures. You're not necessarily seeing that today. Um, but uh, that being said, the VIX is down a, uh, a decent amount. It you know kind of makes us substantiate obviously that, that the rally holds at uh, at this point. You've also got <clears throat> excuse me losing my voice over here. You've also got uh, oil up uh, about a dollar twenty. Oil really uh, for a few weeks was trading kind of lockstep with the S and P's. It's kind of broken and uh, diverged a bit from that. But I've been uh, keeping an eye on it. Uh, in any regard, also Bank of America off of its earnings announcement up a uh, pretty considerable amount. Bank of America up uh, forty cents, which. Forty cents doesn't sound like a lot, but when you realize Bank of America is a little six-dollar underlying. By the way, there's nothing little about Bank of America, uh, including their <clears throat> their ATM or, or debit card fees. Those are not little either. In fact, if you look at the price of Bank of America's stock versus what they're charging for the uh, debit card fees, hey, you can pretty much buy a share of stock every month with the debit card fee. Um, exciting stuff. So with that, we're currently awaiting callers here so uh give us a call because uh otherwise it's just not that exciting 877-927-6648 uh we await you to give us a call and really uh when it comes to uh you know calling options sure you want to talk about constructing a trade maybe around apple's uh earnings announcements here this evening absolutely fair game. I'm going to actually discuss a little bit about uh, Apple here in uh, in just a minute. <laughs> anyway, with that, let's uh, let's kind of jump over, uh, discuss Apple while we're desperately awaiting some phone calls here. So uh, it's going to be, could be a lonely option hour here for uh, for Don today. That's all right. <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll drag some of you guys out kicking and screaming sooner or later. So let's, let's take a look a little bit at Apple. Uh, 
uh, prior to the news announcement, obviously, this evening. And Apple's not the only, you know, uh, big boy releasing tonight. you got Apple and you got Intel. Uh, a couple of others also are obviously releasing earnings. But ultimately, when I think about, uh, you know, when I think about this evening, obviously, uh, after the close here, Apple, Intel, obviously, are, are pretty critical. You've also got Juniper and Yahoo, but, you know, who cares about Yahoo? When you got Intel, Apple, it's going to be more exciting than, than those two. But one thing I look at on Apple, prior to the news announcement coming out, um, we look at what's called market maker move. And I'll discuss this to, uh, to some degree here. On the Thinkorswim platform, we've actually what's called a market maker move. It's in the upper right-hand corner of the trade tab. It's called MMM, market maker move. The market maker move on Apple right now is an indication of a one-day one standard deviation move. What that basically means, it says right now, it says plus or minus $19 and change. It's indication <clears throat> based on order flow within Apple, meaning based on the option order flow, I should say, within Apple's front month options, the front month options being the October options. It's an indication of ultimately <clears throat> how far Apple can move in its it's actually pricing in a one standard deviation move. Now, I know this is, you know, incredibly exciting for a lot of you guys, but, but think about that for a second. I can tell you with, with any degree of certainty that what a one standard deviation move was. And uh, with Tom O'Brien yesterday when, uh, you know, I called in for like five, ten minutes yesterday, we were talking about this a little bit. And he was, uh, he chatted to me and he's like, oh, man, you got to discuss a little bit more about market maker move. You know, it's, it's one of the most underutilized resources you know, to uh, a lot of people that listen to, uh, to TFNN, the market maker move right now is displaying $19. What that means is there's approximately, <clears throat> in a one-day move, meaning that literally tonight earnings come out tomorrow, it's an indication of a $19 move either up or down, and it'll stay in that range approximately 68 0.3% of the time, and that happens to be what they call one standard deviation. You know, 68% of the time is, is one standard deviation. So one of the ways that we solve for market maker move is we take the physical options within the October chain, and again, there's only three days left till expiration. We take those options and we extract okay, all intrinsic value from the options and derive time value, and ultimately that time value, you know, helps us discern how far Apple, for instance, can move. So Apple's indicating about a $19 move. Now, when Google came out, um, you know, Google came out last week, Google had a market maker move of $31. After hours, the stock moved 34 and change. But then when we reopened the next day, it, the stock opened at $31 and about 38 cents. So I kind of got a, a kick out of the whole thing because it's not saying like, hey, we're going to move $19. It says that there's a 68% chance that we stay in a $19 range, either up or down. And somebody says, what happens if the stock moves 50 bucks? Well, guess what? That's the other 32% of the time. With that, I'm going to jump to a caller here right now. And I think that uh, if you guys are listening right now, you should give us a call. The number, of course, is 877-927-6648. The lines are wide open here right now. But uh, let's, let's jump to the first caller. We've got Mark in Bedford, uh, New Hampshire, it looks like, and a uh, question about TZA. You there, Mark? Yes, I uh, sold my uh, calls this morning. I had the 38s that expire on Friday, and I was wondering if I should re-enter. All right, so we're in TZA. I'm um, sorry, you're looking at the Octobers? Yeah, the 22nd, I think they are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, sorry. I was just trying to determine which uh, which expiration you were taking a look at. So um, you're looking at the 38 calls that are slightly in the money here. So the underlying's at 3840, <clears throat> yep. and uh, you just buy in the calls. Um, first of all, are you still bullish in here? Uh, I'm just. You know, I, I actually I sold my I sold my uh, calls this morning, and I'm I'm trying to figure out if it's worthwhile to make another trade or just be patient till tomorrow. Well, with only you know, with obviously with three days to go, the one thing you got to do is try to protect yourself as yep. much as possible from time value. So the burn rate, especially in TZA, which is a uh, a three, you know, times. It's an ETF, obviously, but it's a, it's a triple ETF. Yep. The time value burn 
with an underlying that has, and this thing literally has 122% implied volatility, the burn rate of the front month options in October, when I say the burn rate, the decay associated with them, if I take a look at theta right now, it's a pretty scary number. It's um, On the options you're basically looking at, it's 22 cents, but that's going to grow exponentially larger. Uh, basically, tomorrow you're going to be burning like 50 or 60 cents in these, which means if you're going Okay, if you're going to consider buying options of any kind, try to keep it as a spread. I mean, seriously, it's, there's so much time value risk that if you're slightly wrong directionally here, you're going to be just absolutely toasted, you know, immediately. And when I say, like, you know, use some type of a spread, if you want to take a little bit of, like, a directional shot with, with such a small amount of time left, you can go yeah. out, for instance, and, like, buy a 38 call and sell a 39 call. It totally limits your upside. So, you know, you buy a 38, 39 call spread. The whole spread is trading right now for 38 cents. You can only make a dollar on it, of which you've already paid 39 cents up front. So, you know, you're limiting your profitability to, like, 60 cents. But in any regard, it, it, there's no extrinsic, there's no time premium associated with that spread. And uh, the reality is, man, it'll keep you in business a lot longer not paying $2 for time because those 38 calls right now, they literally have a dollar, they have a dollar fifty of, uh, of time premium in them right now. That's yeah, I mean, I, I got out actually at 360, so. And that was, yeah, that's a good trade. A good trade. Yeah, I just was like, all right, so close it, boom. One thing I, I, I always, I always try to kind of like instill in everybody that calls in the show or just clients I talk to you, there are very few individuals that, that survive just like trading individual options that are at the money. And it's, it's not that it's, it's too hard necessarily to pick direction right. It's too hard to pick direction right and have to cope with the time decay associated with those at the money options. So yeah. <laughs> that's always my big fear. And by the way, the TZA, man, this is a wild underlying. <laughs> you crazy. Because uh, this thing, 122% volatility with a $38 underlying, um, you know, I, I like I like trading options, but I, I like like certainty of like I'm going to sell premium and be left alone. Uh, whenever I look at something like it's a $38 under, uh, dollar underlying with over 100% implied volatility, I, I wouldn't say it makes me nervous, but it makes me like you know I'm not going to trade a lot of contract size in uh, in this thing ultimately because this it's so erratic of an underlying and again this is one that I you know I personally do not trade that much but it's actually amazing looking at a chart here over the summer this thing has been as high as 68 and as low as 30 in that's in like the last like four months <laughs> that's yeah awesome. well you know I like the kind of crazy trades I'll just tell you how I I got my experience in options I turned 20 I mean 2,000 into 20,000 and blew it up in about six weeks that's the best way to get your experience. I was I went I was long gold stocks. I went short the housing market three months before it blew up, and that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me realize I should not be trading naked calls or puts. <laughs> you know what? I I hear that story like way more often than you might think. Like um, I'll never forget this. I saw a count like years ago. Um, I'm sitting on like a, a trade desk, and you know one of the guys on the desk comes up and he goes, "I got to show you this account. <laughs> what do you want to show me?" He goes. Google, and this was back when Google was trading like the $200 range. I mean, it's like years ago. This guy has like, I think it was a $3,500 account. At the time, it was like the minimum opening account that we would accept kind of at, uh, at Thinkorswim. So guy opens up an account, $3,500. We look at it, and like a couple of weeks later, all he did was buy a couple of calls in Google. And his account goes from 3500 to like over fifty grand. <clears throat> and uh, one of the guys in the desk was like, that's amazing. And I go, amazing. I'm like, this is not good. I'm like, this account is going to zero. And the, and so the guy in the desk turns around to me. He goes, "Why? You know, this guy's doing fantastic. You go, know, you gotta, you gotta live for the moment here." Is, is what the guy in the desk was telling me. And I'm like, seriously, the account's going to zero. And so he said, "Okay, why?" I said, "Ultimately, because he now believes that he actually knows what the hell is going on in this business." I'm like, "It's it's the worst thing. It's like when I was a kid. I'll never forget. I was I was 21 years old. And uh, okay, I'll tell you the story that I was 21. But the first time I went to Vegas, I was." You know, not necessarily of age. I went there, <laughs> played some blackjack, and uh, lo and behold, I killed it. The first time I was there, I literally was like a kid. I had the last fifty dollars in my life. I walked out with like a couple of thousand in Vegas, and I realized uh, I was pretty much screwed for life. 
because, um, you know, hey, you're a winner. But I, I always feel that way when I look at, like, buying calls. You know, I've seen accounts go from 3500 to fifty grand and right back down to zero. It's, um, you know, I don't want to say it's a brutal lesson to learn. It's, it's just, you know, the reality is you just can't sustain those, those kind of moves. And yeah, once in a while people do. But the reality is you want to build a business, it's, it's a little bit yeah, more. My, just... my whole approach is then to turn now the money into real estate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm uh, doing. I'm pulling it out as faster and spending it than I, like, than I can, you know. I'm like, hey, hey there's a credit card. Come, I'll spend 10000 now. You should come out to Scottsdale, so, Arizona. Everything is on sale out here. I love it. That's my plan. <laughs> All right, man. All right, Thanks thank for giving you. us a call today, Mark. All right, thanks again. So uh, with that, it's, uh, you know, these, <clears throat> these double and triple inverse ETFs, these are, these are wild underlying. So the one thing I, I always mention whenever, <clears throat> whenever I mention like a double or triple inverse ETF, it's really important, guys, to understand that they don't necessarily track specifically the underlying. They track the intraday moves of some of these underlying. So you just have to kind of keep that in perspective. When I say intraday moves, all these triple levered ETFs, people ask, how do they get this kind of leverage? Well, a lot of the times to get leverage, to get three times leverage, they utilize futures products, in essence, to be able to do that. Like, I'll bring up, for instance, TBT. And I discuss TBT uh, quite often. It's something that, you know, uh, I utilize the product from time to time. And uh, when, I, when I talk, you know, about TBT, it's a double inverse of the TLT. The first thing is to know, what is the TLT? Well, the, T, the TLT is the equivalent of like a 20-year bond, but it's traded as an ETF. And it's, it's meant to, uh, the TLT is meant to mimic, again, <clears throat> the movement of like a 20-year bond, and that's 20-year treasury bond. So the TBT is a double inverse of that. But to get that double inverse move, futures products are utilized, and there is a burn rate and a management fee associated with that. When I say a burn rate, if you hold TBT, if you went out and bought the stock and just held it, and assuming that the TLT never moved, the TLT being the primary, TBT would still literally have a rate of decay associated with it. And I'm talking about the stock now. You know, the ETF itself has a rate of decay associated with it. And that's also true of TZA and all the underlyings out there. So you know, one of the ways to offset some of the rate of decay is to, you know, to utilize, for instance, defined risk option spreads on a month-to-month -month basis and not necessarily hold some of those specific uh, underlyings out there. So uh, with that, if you guys uh, are out there and would like to give us a call, of course, the number is 877-927-6648. We await some of your calls. Anyway, with that, I'm going to jump to another caller here. I've got Scott in Orlando. He's got a question on the Spiders. Are you with us there, Scott? Yes, Sam. How are you doing today, Don? Good. How's it going? Good. Uh, I'm a novice option trader. I basically sell cover calls on some of the holdings I have. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm practicing with some uh, bear call spreads and bear put spreads, and I want to know if there's an advantage of one over the other. Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is if you're utilizing the spiders, you got the right product to practice with, no question about it. Um, I am I'm a huge advocate of utilizing major ETFs like spiders to, uh, to trade options on, especially initially dollar strike increments, really, really tight markets. Um, now, so you're asking about the bear call spread versus, I'm sorry, the bear put, the bear, bear put spread. Yeah. Is there an advantage of one or the, over the other? <clears throat> They're slightly different in the fact that, all right, if you want to create a, uh, a bearish put spread, you could be a buyer of that put spread. So the question is are you buying a put spread in the money or are you buying a put spread out of the money? So there is a difference if you're actually referencing you can sell an out of the money call spread and you can create literally the same trade with puts. But the problem is those puts would be in the money. Is that what you're referencing, some in the money puts? Well, I was looking at, at both options here. And uh, I looked at the, the bear call spread first. Okay. Uh, what I was going to sell. I was looking at the uh, November uh, options. Okay. Uh, in the call spread, I was looking to sell the November 121 calls. Okay. Uh, right now they're around four dollars, sure. and then I was uh, buying the 123 uh, calls uh, for 285. Okay. Okay. So the first, thinking. the first thing I'll mention is is this: <clears throat> when selling a call spread, um, you know, and kind of a prototypical call spread that you'd want to sell. Uh, most often you want to look slightly further out of the money to give yourself a little bit more of a probability of success associated with that. The trade that you're actually kind of deriving here, selling the 121, 123 call spread, that's not by any means wrong. 
<clears throat> it's just a little bit aggressive for the sale of a call spread. So if I pull up the, the 121, like for instance, 123 call spread here, the trade basically, uh, it's, it's a $2 wide spread that you're, you know, for the most part, it's risk a dollar to make a dollar. It's about a 50-50 probability of success associated with that trade. If you looked at the opposing put spread, which would be basically buying the 123 puts, selling the 121 puts, it's almost the same exact trade. You know, and now that's that's kind of the at the money option there. Um, again, you know, when I look at selling call spreads, I look a little bit further out of the money to give myself a little bit more of a probability of success associated with this. I mean, if you sell the 121, 123 spread right now for a buck, if the market stays completely and totally flat, yeah, you'll make your dollar. If the market goes anywhere down, you'll make your dollar. But if the market rallies the slightest bit, you're already obviously, you know, taking on a, a decent amount of risk. Your break even point in the trade is about 122, and we're trading right now at 121 and change. So just kind of keep that in perspective. The, you know, most often when I look at selling spreads, I look to sell spreads between about a 30 and 40 delta. So I'll actually go out to like, you know, in this case, like the 125, like 127 spread, and uh, I look at selling one of those. So like a 125, for instance, 127 spread, <clears throat> the credit isn't nearly as much. It's like 70 cents, risking a buck 30. But the probability in this trade, it's got about a 65% probability of success, whereas the trade you looked at had about a 50-50 chance. And that's, you know, it's just, it's really fine-tuning. Again, your spread's not wrong. Your spread's more aggressive, though. You've got to be right directionally, whereas me, I'm selling a 125, 127 spread. Uh, I can be wrong. The market could still rally $4 against me, and I can still make my, my 70 cents. I see. So that, you're, you're, refer, you're, you're talking about a put spread right now, right? I, I'm actually talking about an out-of-the-money call spread. I'm selling a 125 call, buying a 127 call. That's a, a bearish call spread. Gotcha. So, uh, and then, you know, if you wanted to look at the, the put spread version of that, um, not going to be a big advocate of utilizing a deep in the money put spread. Any time that you sell in the money puts, you could take on some uh, some more considerable amounts of risk. So just kind of keep that in, uh, sure, in mind. Sure, sure. And I'm trying uh, to lower my risk right now. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Seriously, it's it's not that it's necessarily lower risk, the spread that I'm doing, selling the 125, 127. You're actually taking a little bit more dollar-wise risk, but it's giving you a higher probability of success associated with that. Everything, everything in this in this business is a trade-off. You know, if you want a 70% probability of success, you have to accept a little bit lower of a credit up front. And accepting a lower credit up front gives you a little bit more risk on the on kind of the back end of the trade. I see. Okay, well, that's been very informative. I appreciate your help. All right, thanks for giving us a call. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> with that, um, those of you that are listening here, feel free to give us a call, of course, 877-927-6648. We, uh, we appreciate you guys giving us a call because it uh, makes a much more exciting options hour. With that, I'm going to jump to a, uh, another caller here. It's Frank in Tampa. He's got a question about the weeklies out there. Are you with us, Frank? I'm here, Don. Uh, How are you doing? Good talk to you. Oh, good hey, talk to you too. John, question about the weeklies. I, I trade them uh, a lot with the uh, more expensive stocks uh, okay. because of the affordability. And I was wondering, well, when is the optimal time? How long? Let me rephrase that. How long can you hold it before the fade eats you up? It depends if it's an in the money option, out of the money option, or at the money option. Right. I mean, obviously, the yeah. expiration week is a perfect time to discuss it, but <clears throat> if you look at, like, weeklies and you go slightly in the money, there's actually not a lot of theta associated with those. So you've got a lot, of, a lot of clients that they'll go into, for instance, like Google, and I'll pull up Google, for example, because is, is that one of the stocks you're referencing in here? Um, right. I'm not trading Google right now, um, uh, but you can go ahead and use it. Like, so well, that's right with you. <clears throat> Google basically is a, you know, a $587 underlying the October options, they've got three days remaining in the expiration. If you look slightly in the money, when I say slightly in the money, you look to like the 575 strike. Now, there's only three days left in these options, but the 575 strike, you know, it's in the money about, uh, oh, you know, $10, $12 over here. The reality is there's not a lot of time value associated with the 575 strike because it's, it's in the money. Now, how much time value is associated with them? Well, basically, it's you know you can switch the information layouts on Thinkorswim over to what's called extrinsic value 
Um, but all you have to really do is 575, you know, uh, minus wherever the underlying is trading right now, and pull out the intrinsic value. It comes down to about two dollars and nineteen cents of uh, extrinsic value. Now, when you look, for instance, at the at the money options, the at the money options in Google right now, the 590s. Those things have five dollar and ten cents of extrinsic value. That's serious. Okay, the burn rate of those options is going to be considerably higher than the in the money options. So, one of the ways to easily protect yourself in the weekly is with either number one, you can use a, a deeper in the money option, like an eighty delta or more. But the problem is when you go out and you buy an eighty delta option, you got a lot of risk. You know, buying the eighty delta option right now, the five seventy five calls. Things are, you know, they're trading for 14 bucks right now. You could lose $14. The other way to protect yourself from uh, from theta decay is, of course, going to be uh, utilizing some type of a spread. That whereby either utilizing some type of a calendar spread, or for the most part, utilizing some type of vertical spread. And that's, you know, when it comes to weekly options, it's, it's not a half bad idea, especially like if you're trying to take shots. So, what kind of trades are you doing on them? Um, kind of quick. Uh, uh, reversion to the mean or or uh, just swing trades yeah yeah all right so um, are you are you using the at the monies or just you know getting down your hand yeah it's as close to the money as I can afford you know especially like with with like Google for example you know a deep in the money call with uh, just a you know 85 or 70 Delta you know 14 to, to 18 dollars so you know, if you do, you can only do one or two of those, at least with my budget. Sure. Are you but, are you holding them overnight or not? Yes, I do. So when you hold them overnight, you know, again, that's where you really got to protect yourself from theta, because <clears throat> coming into later in the trading day, you're going to see those options burn a pretty considerable amount. So it's you know, and coming into like that expiration, it's like wow, that burn rate is is pretty massive. You hold them overnight, you can really get burned. But when you have an 80 delta or greater, you know, for instance, those 575s. I mean, they only have two dollars of of you know time value left in them. You got to be right though directionally here, <laughs> or obviously uh, fourteen dollars is a large loss to take. Even when it's one contract, it's a pretty serious trade, you know. In here, uh, the other thing that you could kind of look to do with with such a sh uh, like short amount of time left is you could look to take a little directional position here, and I'll give you an idea. Right now, you could go out, you could buy. For instance, if you were bullish on Google, you could buy. 585, 590 call spread for two dollars and forty cents. The amount of time value in this trade <clears throat> is almost nothing. I mean, actually, the spread right now—it's a five-dollar wide spread. The spread is literally going for two fifty right now. So, in a five-dollar wide spread that's trading for two fifty, you're basically risking two fifty to be able to make two fifty. Uh, the calls themselves only have—I mean, the 585 calls are already in the money by two dollars and thirty cents. And you're only paying 250 for this whole spread. The downside of this spread is that you kind of have to hold it almost until those weeklies expire, almost until the weeklies expire, to make almost the entire two dollars and fifty cents. Um, but this this trade, I mean, it really protects you, really protects you. And in terms of like you know profit and loss out there, in the surface it doesn't look as good as hey you risk fourteen dollars you made five bucks on it and you're like oh, I hit it out of the ballpark. But you got to look at like you know the defined risk nature of this spread. It's a lot easier to stomach a two dollar and fifty cent loss rather right. than a dollar. And you know, if it doesn't, you don't even have to go into money to make money. I mean, if things go your way and you get close, you can still almost double your money. Sure. Um, and, and, and I'm using I'm using a slightly in the money call spread. And, and the reason I'm doing this because if you're directional in nature. You're a little bit more aggressive. I'm trying to limit the amount of time value associated with my spread. Like I don't want to pay anything for time. And this 585, 590 spread. What's interesting is if Google stays totally flat between now and three days from now, you basically break even on this trade. If Google goes up two dollars, and you know Google's going to move more than obviously than two or three dollars, but if, if Google moves up two bucks, you almost maximize a five dollar wide spread. You know, you make 250 in the trade. If Google goes down at all, you lose 250. It's it's pretty cut and dry. You know, you got about 50, 50, uh, about a 50 50 shot. Risk 250 to be able to make 250. Um, the reality is, yeah, you know, it's great if you're right. 
uh, you also you might be right today and have to exit the trade, and then uh, two days later, you know, watch the thing go against you. But remember, you can't make the full amount though on a five dollar wide spread until uh, expiration cycles up. So uh, well, hopefully that that provides you a little bit of ideas <clears throat> in regards to mitigating some of the risks surrounding time value in, uh, in some of those weekly options there. Yeah, it does, because a lot of times I really neglect the, the uh, extrinsic value, and I'm focused on the, uh, you know, the strike and the bid and ask, and you can, you can, the extrinsic and, yeah. intrinsic and extrinsic is so important, you know, I mean, to being in a good and bad trade, um, because you can have the, the, the odds stacked against you from the outset, if you're, if you're, you know. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, I, it, you know, it's such a hard thing to deal with. Like, I'm just not a big premium buyer. You know, in this business, I made a decision early on. I'm like, ah, the hell with it. <clears throat> if I'm going to be involved in options, I'm going to be a seller of options. There used to be a guy that uh, that, that I've worked with for, for years and years. In fact, I'm literally chatting with him on Instant Messenger as, as talking to you guys. But uh, there's a guy I've, I've worked with for years, and he, he used to sit there and chant all day long, never an option buyer B, never an option buyer B. And I... I used to think to myself, I mean, does that mean really never buy an option? And he's like, no, no, no. What it really means is, you know, don't be out there buying extrinsic or time premium. He goes, because time premium sooner or later, you know, it's, it crushes you out there. The reality is, if you buy options and you're right, you can hit it out of the ballpark. But today, in today, like today's marketplace, it's just, it's such a skittish market. Who the hell knows where we're even going to be tomorrow? Apple's earnings come out tonight. I'll tell you what, Apple's earnings could be spectacular in this market get, get crushed. Apple's earnings could absolutely suck, and this market is going to get crushed. So it's you know even if I had the numbers on Intel or Apple before this evening, I still couldn't make a good directional trade. That's that's part of the problem with markets today, is as things become more and more efficient in the marketplace, you have to get smarter with your logic and strategies out there. And that's you know my belief is this business is more about logic and the strategy utilized today than it is about being right or wrong. And that's, that's an argument that I'll, I'll make kind of, you know, nonstop here. So um, anyway, I thank you uh, for giving us a call, and uh, feel free to give us a call in the, in the future there. Absolutely, yeah, big fan. And uh, right. I listen to you as much as I can on TOS as well. Excellent, excellent. Thanks again. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be jumping back on Thinkorswim here in about, the, about a half an hour or so. All right, cool. All right, thanks a lot, man. Uh, with that, I'm going to jump to, uh, to our next caller. But, again, if you guys are out there, you want to give us a call, of course, it's 877-927-6648. And it looks like we're going to jump to a call. Uh, Richard in California has got a question about about Apple. Wow, what a surprise. You there, Richard? Yeah, hey, Don. Hey, um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'm always long 200 shares of Apple. I just think it's got a great future even without Steve Jobs. And what I do is I sell calls against it as, you know, going through time. However, um, you know, I think today's earnings will be pretty good, and so I didn't sell any calls against the stock, um, you know, for this week. And I'm wondering, I'm getting a little nervous now, is there anything I can do to kind of protect against, you know, perhaps a bad earnings report or just, you know, stock crashes, maybe there isn't built into it at this point, um, and still participate in, you know, if, if there's a big upside. Is there just some kind of insurance I can get against just a catastrophic meltdown? Sure, sure. There's a couple different things you can do. If you, uh, <clears throat> if you don't mind giving up a, a little bit of the upside, not a lot of the upside. So in Apple, you know, I, I agree with you. Like, I just, I, I got to tell you, a lot of earnings announcements, like I usually have a pretty decent feel, or at least I have usually a pretty good comment on what I think the underlying is going to do. Apple today, it's had a hell of a run-up coming into this announcement. And you always got to worry about, like, the buy the rumor, sell the news kind of thing. So, you know, with this kind of a run-up, Apple's good earnings could be priced in. But then again, I think to myself, I'm like, you know, it's freaking Apple. I mean, this stock is, has amazed the hell out of me time and time again. By the way, Apple is a stock that I absolutely love to hate. I love every one of their products. You know, I've got, you know, my Mac-issued underwear. I'm literally sitting here with an iPad, an iPhone. You know, uh, I've got the 17-inch, like, you know, power book in front of me. But at the same time, I absolutely will not trade any derivatives or the primary underlying here because I got smoked on Apple back when it was, like, $200, uh, literally when the stock was 200 bucks. I got smoked taking the opposite side of that trade. 
that was the last one for me. I don't know. This, this underlying absolutely hates me, but I kind of agree with you. I'm a little nervous coming into the earnings announcement here. Um, something that you could look to do is to create a really simple collar around your stock for, if you want, you could do it for the next three days or you can do it for 31 days. And what a collar really entails, it will be such an easy thing to do for, uh, for you. So <clears throat> Apple's trading at 420 bucks right now, almost on the button. Its market maker move is indicating now a $19.42 move. It's, it's actually the risk is coming up into the earnings announcement, which uh, you know ultimately here um, what we're looking at is, again, they're implying a little bit more risk than they were earlier today. What the collar really can do is, I'll make this as easy as, as can be. You could look at, for instance, buying like the 400 puts. The 400 puts are trading, let's say, for $3.50. Then go out and, for example, cover the cost of the trade, for the most part, by selling like the 445s. Now, I've constructed the collar with a very small debit. Buying the 400 puts for 350 obviously is a debit of 350 selling the 445 calls for $3 and let's say 10 cents. The whole trade will cost you about 40 cents, not including commissions. But what the 400 puts do is give you, uh, if you buy two contracts against 200 shares, it will obviously give you definitive downside protection. It gives you the right to sell Apple at 400. You never have to sell Apple at 400. Apple can go to 350. You have the, uh, obviously, the 400 puts which would go intrinsic, have $50 of value with the stock at 350. Now, the 445 calls, it gives you upside. It gives you upside to $445. If we blow to 450, you just can't be pissed off about it. I mean, for the most <laughs> had a lot of upside. You got to give up something. And this, you know, what's interesting about this is um, actually makes me a little nervous here. It's how equally priced the calls and puts are in Apple right now. When I say equally priced, there is very little skew in the option chain in Apple, which, and what skew is, for those of you that, are, that aren't really aware, <clears throat> when you look at the out-of-the-money puts versus the out-of-the-money calls, typically you would see the out-of-the-money puts trade for a considerable premium over the out-of-the-money calls. What's scary about Apple is simply this. If you look at the out-of-the-money puts, the 400 puts are exactly $20 out-of-the-money. They're trading for 350 if you look at the exact equidistant out-of-the-money calls, which would be basically the 440 calls, they're trading for actually more than the puts. This is very, very rare. You're seeing an inverted volatility skew, which uh, to me is, is a scary thing coming into an earnings announcement, a very scary thing coming into an earnings announcement. There's nobody buying puts really against the stock. Order flow is actually buying calls against this underlying, and it's inverting the volatility skew. Years ago when I'd see this, uh, you know, we made markets, this was always, you know, kind of an indication. The whole world's bullish. Get short. I'm, I'm serious. That's, that's the way we used to look at it. Whether that's true or not right now, it's just been a hell of a run-up here in Apple, and I, I'm always, always nervous when I see an inverted volatility skew. And to be honest with you, this is the first time that I've really looked at detail in the option chain. So, you know, thank you for calling in about a collar because I wouldn't have caught this one otherwise. But there's definitely an inverted volatility skew here, and it uh, it basically means the risk in Apple uh, tends to be to lean to the upside. And a lot of contrarians look at this as as kind of a bearish take. Um, so a lot of you know retail clients think we're going to rally. A lot of professionals always take the other side of that. So it's it is an interesting uh, take on the marketplace. But yeah, I would I would look at buying the 400 puts and selling the 445 uh, calls against it, and um, and collar off a portion of your position there. Again, man, it leaves you $25 of upside. You only have about $20 of downside risk, and uh, you'll be able to sleep you know a little bit. <laughs> the only thing is, you better fire here in the next uh, you know three hours because. <laughs> uh, Okay. You got three hours left, and, and this volatility skew could change pretty drastically. But for such a small debit, I think it's worth um, it's worth being able to. I'd say sleep at night, but you're not going to be able to sleep at night. You're going to be looking at like you know, one fifteen, you know, West Coast time out here. You know, uh, it's at uh, one fifteen. We'll uh, we'll know. Yeah, we'll definitely. Yeah, well, know. A lot could happen tomorrow too. I think it's going to sell off you know, overnight, even if there is good earnings. So. Yeah. Yeah, that, lot, that's man. one of the things that, that that I keep looking at. Like, I truly believe that Apple is going to drive order flow for the entire marketplace tomorrow. 
So it's going to set the tone. And although this market has run up, this market's run up a ridiculous amount. The market wants to rally right now. Unfortunately, if you look at like IBM, IBM, eh, not that good of news. But IBM, basically, you look at IBM right now and what, what's happened on the day. The news was, you know, for IBM is, is not great. So IBM's down about 10 bucks. It's like this never even happened. The NASDAQ futures are up 25 right now. S&P futures are up 16. Obviously, the entire world said, oh, the hell with it. Duh, IBM doesn't mean anything. And, and you saw like Bank of America. Their numbers were all right. And uh, all of a sudden, it's up 40 cents. This market wants to rally. It scares me. It definitely scares me because the slightest bit of real bad news, and Apple is the darling right now, uh, they, could, you know, they could actually provide great news, and it could still screw up everything. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Don. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you for giving us a call. I yeah, appreciate it. So uh, actually, uh, really interesting, uh, interesting uh, look, obviously, at Apple there. So something always to consider is before one of these earnings announcements, you could always consider utilizing a collar in the short term. Um, you know, strategically speaking, I don't, I don't necessarily think like a collar is a spectacular trade. The collar lets you sleep at night. Now, you don't have to create a collar always for three days. I mean, obviously, to, uh, to get a little nervous prior to the earnings announcement, sure, put a collar on there. You know, if you own a gazillion shares of a stock and you want to really kind of hedge risk or protect risk, the problem is when you go out and buy puts in the marketplace, puts are expensive. Buying put protection is ridiculously expensive. And I'll tell you exactly how expensive it is. If you were to look right now, for example, in the S&P 500, so I pull up the spiders, and you were to buy puts on a month-to-month -month basis, and the put that you bought was approximately a 35 delta put. So if you bought a 35 delta put that had exactly one month to go, think about how much that put would cost okay, all year long. So if you bought a put, you know, like the 118 puts this month, well, it cost $2.65. Then you bought a put next month, well, it cost another, let's say, $2.50. Literally, you know, if there was exactly a month to go, you'd be paying approximately 31%. The implied volatility, you'd be paying approximately 31% of the underlying price of the spiders to hedge your risk for a year. That's interesting. Why is that interesting? It's interesting because the S&P 500 has been shown historically to appreciate approximately 8% in a given year. It makes a lot of sense to pay 31% for protection in an underlying that appreciates only on average about well, about 8%. So, uh, yeah, always keep your, uh, your mind open to the fact that buying puts might not necessarily be a good thing. Listen, if you own a stock and you're like, oh, man, I really need put protection right now, you could always sell the stock. And, you know, you could utilize some type of defined risk option trade or you could look towards a collar. Now, I'll show you this again. If you look right now, the underlying is at 121, uh, let's say 58. Take a look at some of the out-of-the-money puts here in the spiders versus the out of the money calls. And you'll notice that the puts trade for a considerable premium over the calls. You'll see these these 115 puts. They're about $6 out of the money, but the 115 puts are trading for almost 2 bucks. You look at the 128 calls, and the 128 calls are yeah, they're almost equidistant out of the money, but you know, even the 127 calls, they're trading only for $1.25. The 128 calls are trading for like, uh, you know, 95 cents. Why are the 115 puts trading for two bucks? Because the reality is the world perceives risk in the marketplace to the downside. You know, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and have the S&P 500 crash up. You know, ooh, we're at 121 today. Holy crap, we crashed all the way to 130. I don't think so. I don't think I've ever woken up into a, uh, you know, uh, literally a crash to the upside. We've seen some wild moves to the upside, especially in 08 during the bear market. It was, yeah, that was kind of exciting, but the reality is markets don't typically crash to the upside. Now, that being said, market today closes at 121. Horrific news comes out about Apple tomorrow, and all of a sudden you see the market open, for instance, at 115. That, that doesn't surprise me. You know, that, that happens, and that's why ultimately the, uh, the market prices this in. So people literally go out and they buy puts for protection, and they sell calls to finance the cost of some of those puts out there. And that ultimately creates what they call a volatility skew. More people buy puts and to finance those puts, again, they sell calls. And that literally tweaks, uh, literally tweaks the option chain itself. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of a cool you know, perspective. When you start to look at specific underlines like Apple, its chain is completely inverted. And you saw 
that exact same thing happened on gold before gold came uh, came down considerably. It was like a Goldman Sachs analyst came out and he said, "Oh, gold." This is when gold was at nineteen hundred bucks. Guy comes out and he goes, "Gold will be at twenty five hundred," and the volatility skew inverted. All of a sudden, price gold risk to the upside. I'm like. Oh, this is interesting. It's it's not to say that, you know, this is a prelude to Apple going down, but it just tells you what people are looking at and what people are doing in terms of trading. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of people here that have uh, a hell of a lot of positive belief, of course, in Apple, because when you start to look ultimately at, at you know, the move this underlying could have and the way the options are priced, you know, again, perceived risk here is, is to the upside, and that's uh, a very, very unusual circumstance, uh, especially coming out to uh, to earnings announcements. Um, so, with that, uh, yeah, let's let's talk about a, a couple other things here, like including Intel. <laughs> we forgot about Intel. That kind of funny. Intel, one of the largest companies out there, and uh, ultimately, who the hell cares? Why? Because Apple's earnings are coming out. Listen, if I was a firm and I had my earnings coming out the same day as Apple, I would move it. I would just change them because you just don't want to get caught. In that, in that kind of crossfire. That being said, if, uh, if you know your earnings are really, really crappy and you think Apple's going to be decent out there, that's the day that you want to release your earnings, right? Hide behind the shield that is Apple out there. Uh, and it's funny because if you listen to all the media out there, there's been like nothing about Intel. They're like, so Apple, and they go on for about 15 minutes, and they go, oh, yeah, and there's another company, Intel. They make all the chips for all the crap that you use, but don't worry about them because there's Apple today. Um, so uh, with that, I'm reading here in the den. Uh, feel free to uh, to try to chat in some questions. I did see the, the question earlier about the collars, so I um, I appreciate that you guys chatted that in, and I uh, at some point I knew I'd get to that, uh, that question in there. Um, with that, also uh, feel free to chat in any uh, any remaining questions because uh, again, it's it's always kind of a lonely show when uh, you know a couple of callers in here. It's uh, it's good stuff, good stuff. So I'm just reading through the uh, through the Tiger Den. Um, with that, let's uh, let's take a look again. Intel, Intel right now is trading for 23.41 on the button. Market maker move is indicating approximately a one dollar move. So a hey, percentage wise, it's a pretty decent move. You know. <clears throat> When you looked at Apple, percentage-wise, a $20 move in Apple isn't that much. The Intel move is also, you know, a dollar move and a $23 underlying. It's yeah, it's a pretty decent move out there. So, what could we look to do if, for instance, in, in Intel here, Intel's got like three days, obviously, left to the expiration cycle, just like every other underlying. You can look towards the weekly options, but in, for instance, Intel, if you want to get bullish or bearish. <clears throat> in something like Intel, you might have to look to get a little bit more aggressive and buy some type of in-the-money spread. The trade I'd look at, like in Intel, if you wanted to be bullish, I'd buy like a 123, 124 call spread. And for the most part, by buying a 123, 124 call spread in Intel, it very much limits any extrinsic premium. We've been talking about time value all day. A 123, 124 call spread is trading right now for literally for 50 cents. You can buy it right now for 50 cents. That's pretty much the market on it. You buy that thing for 50 cents, you're risking 50 cents to be able to make approximately 50 cents, not including commissions out there. Lo and behold, it's got about a 50-50 chance. But <clears throat> the interesting thing is it's a shot. It's a directional shot. But the market maker move is indicating a dollar move. There is almost no extrinsic premium in here because the underlying is already at 23.40, meaning that these 23 calls that you'd be buying, they already have 40 cents of real value in them, and you're only paying 50 cents for the spread. Now, that's if you were bullish, you'd buy the 23.24 spread. If you're bearish, you could look to the exact opposite. You could buy the 24.23 spread, and I'd buy that one also for, well, it's right about 50 cents. So uh, buying the 24 puts selling the 23 puts. Again, whether you're bullish or bearish, I like to, <clears throat> I like to take both sides of the markets over, over here. It's um, why? Because, you know, I have no idea where Intel's earnings are coming out, and I'll also make the argument that does anybody care? No. Well, why? Because when Apple comes out, it's probably going to move a little bit of Intel as well. Um, the reality is one could be great, one could be bad. There would be a divergence between Intel and Apple. But ultimately, it's a nice short-term directional position here um, so there's, there's, there's literally, you know, three days to go to expiration. You're just taking a shot directionally. And a lot of people that listen, you know, and, and trade options, 
They like to take these shots. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. It's like, you know, take a shot directionally, but ultimately, that's, you know, that's not really going to make a, a business. Options trading is, you know, consider it a business. Trading around earnings, there's no certainty around the earnings, so it's tough to, you know, base your business around taking shots. Ultimately, this business is much more about selling premiums. Obviously, I utilize, you know, products like the Spiders, an extensive amount, selling out-of-the-money premium, trying to define risk, to mitigate risk in any way, shape, or form. And uh, the defined risk nature of the business, you know, selling spreads, helps you weather the storm when you are wrong. You notice every trade that I've discussed really ultimately today has been some type of... Cutting in, cutting out over here, so sorry about that. Um, but ultimately, you know, keep things defined risk as much as possible. So with that, uh, kind of a, a wrap up here a little bit. S&P futures are up uh, 1525. NASDAQ futures are up 20. Uh, kind of a, uh, a little bit of a surprising rally to me on a day like this. I thought that uh, we would continue to see a little bit of selling pressure. What's also interesting today is we we actually saw a true intraday reversal. Futures were down pretty good today, rallied back up. The VIX is confirming that this is a you know a decent sized rally today. VIX is down a buck sixty three. Obviously, uh, gold is off, but the gold trade is gold is is just that it's a trade now. It's not really indicating risk so much per se. Um, bonds uh, bonds are actually the surprising factor here. Bonds are up very very slightly, kind of on the day still indicating that there's a decent amount of risk just in the general marketplace. So when you see bonds up, that's usually kind of a guarded stance, especially with uh, this much news coming out. Anyway, with that, I appreciate everybody listening today to, to the TFNN show. Again, join us uh, every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time for the TFNN show. My name is Don Coffin from Thinkorswim from TD Ameritrade. Thank you guys very much for joining us, and uh, see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.